Book 17. Menelaus' Finest Hour. But Atreus' son the fighting Menelaus marked it all, the Trojans killing Patroclus there in the brutal carnage, and crested now in his gleaming bronze gear Atrides plowed through the front to stand astride the body, braced like a mother cow lowing over a calf, her firstborn, first labor pangs she'd felt. So the red-haired captain bestrode Patroclus now, shielding his corpse with spear and round buckler, burning to kill off any man who met him face to face. But Euphorbus who hurled the lethal ashen spear would not neglect his kill, Patroclus' handsome body. Halting close beside it, he taunted fighting, Menelaus. Back, high and mighty Atrides, captain of armies, back from the corpse, and leave the bloody gear. I was the first Trojan, first of the famous allies to spear Patroclus down in the last rough charge. So let me seize my glory among the Trojans now, or I'll spear you too, I'll rip your own sweet life away. But the red-haired captain flared back in anger. Father Zeus, listen to this indecent, reckless bluster. Not even the leopard's fury makes the beast so proud, not even the lions, not the murderous wild boars, the greatest pride of all, bursting the boar's chest they are nothing next to the pride of panther sons with their strong ashen spears. But no, no joy did even powerful Hyperina, breaker of horses, get from his young strength when he scorned me, stood up to me, reviling me as the weakest fighter in all Achaea's armies. Home he went, I'd say, but not on his own two feet, and brought no cheer to his loyal, loving wife and devoted parents. And you, I'll break your courage for you too if you try to take me on. Go back to your own rank and file, I tell you. Don't stand up against me, or you will meet your death. Even a fool learns something once it hits him. So he warned but failed to shake Euphorbus who shot right back, now, high and mighty Atrides, now by heaven you pay in blood for the brother you laid low. You glory over it too, making his wife a widow lost in the depths of their new bridal chamber, bringing his parents cursed tears and grief. But I could stop that wretched couple's pain if only I brought your head and bloody armor home and laid them in panther's arms, in lovely frontis arms. We're wasting time. Our fight's unfought, untested, we'll see who stands his ground, who cuts and runs. And he stabbed Menelaus' round shield, full center, not battering through, the brazen point bent back in the tough armor. But his turn next, Menelaus rose with a bronze lance and a prayer to Father Zeus and lunging out at Euphorbus just dropping back, pierced the pit of his throat leaning into it hard, his whole arms weight in the stroke to drive it home and the point went slicing through the tender neck. He fell with a crash, armor ringing against his ribs, his locks like the grace's locks splashed with blood, still braided tight with gold and silver clips, pinched in like a wasp's waist. There he lay like an olive slip a farmer rears to strength on a lonely hilltop, drenching it down with water, a fine young stripling tree, and the wind stir it softly, rustling from every side, and it bursts with silver shoots. Then suddenly out of nowhere a wind in gale force comes storming, rips it out of its trench, stretches it out on the earth. So Panther's stripling son lay sprawled in death, Euphorbus who hurled the strong ashen spear. Menelaus cut him down, was stripping off his armor. Menelaus fierce as a mountain lion sure of his power, seizing the choicest head from a good grazing herd. First he cracks its neck, clamped in his huge jaws, mauling the kill then down in gulps he bolts it, blood and guts. And around him dogs and shepherds raise a fierce din but they keep their distance, lacking nerve to go in and take the lion on, the fear that grips their spirit makes them blanch. So now not a single Trojan fighter had the spine to go and face Atrides tensing in all his strength. Then and there Menelaus might have stripped Euphorbus and swept the Trojan's glittering armor off with ease if Apollo had not grudged him all that glory, rousing Hector against him, swift as ours. Taking a man's shape, the Sicones captain Mentes, Apollo spurred him on with winged orders. Hector, you're chasing the wild wind, fiery Achilles' team. They are hard for mortal men to curb and drive, for all but Achilles his mother is immortal. But all the while Menelaus, Atreus' fighting son bestrides Patroclus, his killed the Trojans' best, Panther's son Euphorbus, stopped his fury cold. And back Apollo strode, a god in the wars of men. But grief bore down on Hector, packing his dark heart as he scanned the battle lines and saw the worst at once, the two men there, one stripping the gleaming armor, the other sprawled on the ground, blood still spurting warm from his slashed throat. Down the front he charged, crested in flashing bronze, Hector loosing a savage cry and flaring on like fire, like the god of fire, the blaze that never dies. And the cry pierced Menelaus, deeply torn now as he probed his own great heart. What can I do? 
If I leave this splendid gear and desert Patroclus, who fell here fighting, all to redeem my honour, won't any comrade curse me, seeing me break away. But if I should take on Hector and Hector's Trojans alone, in single combat trying to save my pride, won't they encircle me, one against so many? This flashing Hector has all Troy at his back. But why debate, my friend, why thrash things out? When you fight a man against the will of the gods, a man they have sworn to honour then look out, a heavy wave of ruins about to overwhelm you. Surely no Achaean will curse me, seeing me now, giving ground to Hector. Since fighting Hector's flanked by God Almighty. Ah if only I knew where Arjax could be found, that man with his ringing war cry, we two together would go back to the melee calling up our fury, even fight in the teeth of every god on high and haul the body back to Achilles somehow. Things are bad, but that would be the best. Working it out, his heart racing as on they came, waves of Trojan soldiers and Hector led them in. Anatrides gave ground, he left the corpse but kept on turning round to face an attack, like a great bearded lion the dogs and field hands drive back from the folds with spears and sharp cries and the brave. Battling heart in his chest freezes tight and the big cat, all reluctance, pulls back from the sheds. So the red-haired captain backed away from Patroclus' corpse but wheeled at bay when he reached his waiting allies, glancing round and round for Arjuk's massive hulk. All at once on the left flank he marked him, spurring companions, urging them to fight, for Phoebus had filled each man with quaking fear. Atrides went on the run and reached him, shouting. Arjax! Hurry, my friend, this way fight for dead Patroclus! At least we could bring his body back to Achilles, stripped as Patroclus is but not Achilles' armour, Hector with that flashing helmet has seized it all. So he roused the fury in battling Arjuk's heart and down the front he stalked with the red-haired king. Hector, tearing the famous armour off Patroclus, tugged hard at the corpse, mad to hack the head from the neck with bronze and drag the trunk away to glut the dogs of Troy. But in charged Arjuk's, shield like a tower before him and Hector, falling back on a crowd of comrades, leapt to his chariot, flinging the burnished gear to his waiting troops to haul away to Troy, trophies to be his own enormous glory. But Arjax, shielding Patroclus round with his broad buckler, stood fast now like a lion cornered round his young when hunters cross him, leading his cubs through woods, he ramps in all the pride of his power, bristling strength, the heavy folds of his forehead frowning down his eyes. So Arjax stood his ground over brave Patroclus now, the fighting Atrides right beside him, standing fast, his grief mounting, every waiting moment. But Glaucus, Hippolochus son and lord of Lycia's forces now, scowled at Hector, lashing out at him. Hector, our prince of beauty, in battle all a sham. That empty glory of yours a runner's glory, a scurrying girl's at that. Now you'd better plan how to save your city, you alone and your native troopers born in Troy. Now not a single Lycian goes to fight the Argives, not to save your Troy. What lasting thanks for us, for warring with your enemies, on and on, no end. What hope has the common soldier in your ranks to be saved by you, Hector, you heart of iron? If you could quit Sarpedon, your guest and friend in arms abandoned there as carrion fit for the Argive moors. Think what a staunch support Sarpedon was to you and to all Troy while the man was still alive. Now you lack the daring to save him from the dogs. So now, if any Lycian troops will obey my orders, home we go, and headlong death can come and topple Troy. If the Trojans had that courage, unswerving courage that fires men who fight for their own country, beating their enemies down in war and struggle, then we could drag Patroclus back to Troy at once. If we could haul him from battle, dead as he is, and lodge him behind King Priam's looming walls, our enemies would release Sarpedon's gear at once and then, then we could bring his body back to Troy. For the man we cut down here was the loyal friend of Prince Achilles, far the greatest among the Argive ships and at his command go rugged fighters hand to hand. But you with enemy war cries ringing in your ears, you lack the nerve to go up against great Arjax, that fierce heart, to look him straight in the eye and fight the man head on, he's a better man than you. With a dark glance from under his flashing helmet Hector lashed back. Glaucus, such brazen insolence from a decent man like you, but why? Are too bad, and I always thought you excelled the rest in sense, all who hail from Lycia's fertile soil. But now, you fill me with contempt, what are you saying? You tell me that I can't stand up to monstrous Arjax. I tell you I never cringe at war and thundering horses. But the will of Zeus will always overpower the will of men, Zeus who strikes fear in even the bravest man of war and tears away his triumph, all in a lightning flash, 
and at other times he will spur a man to battle. Come on, my friend, stand by me, watch me work. See if I prove a coward dawn to dusk your claim, or I stop some Argive, blazing in all his power, from fighting on to shield Patroclus' corpse. With that he loosed a shrill cry to his Trojans. Trojans. Lycians. Dardan fighters hand to hand, now be men, my friends, call up your battle fury. I'll strap on the brave Achilles' armor, burnished armor I stripped from strong Patroclus when I killed him. So he cried and his own bronze helmet flashed as Hector veered away from the heavy fighting, running after his men and caught them quickly. They'd not gone far and he ran with eager strides as they bore Achilles' famous arms toward Troy. Standing far from the war and all its heartbreak Hector exchanged his armor, handing his own gear to his battle-hungry troops to return to holy Troy, and donned the deathless arms of Peleus' son Achilles, arms the gods of the sky once gave his loving father, and Peleus passed them on to his son when he grew old but the son would not grow old in his father's armor. Now, when Zeus who arrays the cloud saw Hector from afar, strapping on the gear of Peleus' godlike son, he shook his head and addressed his own deep heart, poor soldier. Never a thought of death weighs down your spirit now, yet death is right beside you. You don the deathless arms of a great fighter, and all other fighters tremble before him, true, but you, you killed his comrade, gentle, strong, and against all rights you ripped the immortal armor off his head and shoulders. So great power for the moment I will grant you to compensate for all that is to come, never again will you return from battle, Hector, nor will Andromache take that famous armor, Achilles' deathless armor, from your hands. So he decreed and the son of Cronus bowed his craggy dark brows. Zeus fitted the armor tightly on Hector's body and Ar surged in his heart with awesome force, filling his limbs with power and fighting strength. And on he strode amidst his illustrious Trojan allies, calling out with wild cries, now flashing before them all in the gleaming battle gear of great-hearted Achilles. He ranged their ranks, inspiriting every captain, commanding Mestals, Glaucus, Medon, Thersilochus, Asteropius, Dysonor, Hippothus, Forces, Chromius, Enomus too, who could read the flight of birds. Hector drove them on with winging orders, hear me, numberless tribes of allies living round our borders, I neither sought nor needed enormous hordes of men that day I called you here, each from your own city. What I needed was men to shield our helpless children, fighting men to defend our Trojan women all out, against these savage Argives. That goal in mind, I bleed my own people for gifts and food so I can build your courage, each and every man. So now, each of you, turn straight for the enemy, live or die that is the lovely give and take of war. That man who drags Patroclus back to Trojan charioteers, dead as Patroclus is, and makes great Arjax yield, to him I will give one half the bloody spoils, keep half for myself, his glory will equal mine. Strong vow, and they bore straight down on the Argives full force, shaking their spears, their hearts fired with hopes of dragging Patroclus' body out from under Arjax, fools. Over the corpse he'd cut down crowds of men, though now, at this point, Arjax warned Menelaus, lord of the battle cry, old friend, my prince, I lose hope that we alone, on our own power, can make it back from the fighting. I not only fear for our comrade's body, Patroclus will glut the dogs and birds of Troy and all too soon, but I fear for my own head, for my own life. And yours too, Menelaus, look at this cloud of war that blots out all the field, this Hector, this headlong death that stares us in the face. Quick, call to the chiefs, if one can hear you now. At that the prince of the battle cry complied with a high-piercing shout that reached all troops, friends lords of the Argives, O oh my captains. All who join the Atridae, Agamemnon and Menelaus, who drink wine at the king's expense and hold command of your own troops, your rank and fame from Zeus. Impossible now to pick you out, my captains, man by man, the battle blazes up so wildly. Forward, each on his own. You'll die of shame if the dogs of Ilium make Patroclus ripping sport. And the quick Oilian Arjax heard him clearly, first on the run along the fighting front to meet him, Idomeneus after him and Idomeneus good aid, Mary owns, a match for the butcher god of war. For the rest who followed, waking Achaea's war lust, what man has spirit strong enough to sing their names? Down in a mass the Trojans pounded, Hector led them in, charging in as a heavy surf roars in against the rip at a river's mouth, swelled with rains from Zeus, and on either side the jutting headlands bellow back at the booming sea with matching thunder, in they came, the Trojans roaring in. 
but the Argives faced them, standing fast in a ring around Patroclus, one fury seizing their hearts, packing a wall of bronze shields and round about their glittering crested helmets now the son of Cronus spread a dense, deepening mist. He had never hated Menoetius' son in the past, while he was alive and still Achilles' aid, and now the father loathed to see him pray to Troy's marauders, the ravening dogs of Troy, so he drove his comrades on to shield his corpse. At first the Trojans could ram the Argives back and they abandoned the corpse, their fiery-eyed battalions fled away in panic. But still the breakneck Trojans, up in arms as they were, killed off none of the Argives with their spears, instead they began to drag away Patroclus' corpse. But not for long would his comrades give him up, in a swift maneuver Arjax wheeled them round, Arjax, greatest in build, greatest in works of war of all the Argives after Peleus' matchless son. Right through the front he plowed like a wild boar ramping in power up on the high mountain ridges, scattering dogs and reckless hunters at one charge when he wheels at bay and drives them down the glades. So now the son of noble Telamon, dauntless Arjax scattered the massing Trojan packs at a charge, all who bestrode Patroclus now, high with hopes of dragging him back to Troy to win the glory. Trying hardest, Hippothus out for fame. Pelasgian Letha's son, lashing a shield strap round the ankle tendons, was hauling Patroclus foot first through the melee, hoping to please Prince Hector and all the Trojans, Hippothus rushing on but death came just as fast. No Trojans could save him now, strain as they might Arjax son of Telamon charging quickly into the carnage speared him at close range through the bronze-cheeked helmet, the horsehair crest cracked wide open around the point, smashed by the massive spear and hand that drove it. His brains burst from the wound in sprays of blood, soaking the weapon's socket, his strength dissolved on the spot, his grip loosed and he dropped the foot of brave Patroclus' corpse. There on the ground it lay he rushed to join it, pitching over the dead man's body face to face, a world away from Larissa's dark rich soil. Never would he repay his loving parents now for the gift of rearing, his life cut short so soon, brought down by the spear of lion-hearted Arjax. Hector hurled at him, a sudden glint of the spear, but Arjax saw it coming and dodged the bronze shaft, just by a hair, and the weapon caught Scedius, gallant Iphitus' son and Phocia's finest man, who made his home in the famous town of Panopeus, ruling tribes of men. Hector speared him now, the point split the collarbone, slashing through and out by the shoulder's base, sticking out the back. He fell with a crash, his armor clanging round him. Arjax next, with a lunge he stabbed forces, Phenops' warrior son bestriding Hippothus' corpse, he ripped his belly, smashing the corslet just where the plates join and the bronze spearhead spilled his entrails out and down went forces, grasping, clawing the dust. The Trojan front gave ground, glorious Hector too and the Argives yelled wildly, dragging the bodies, hauling Hippothus' corpse along with forces now and tearing the bloody armor off their backs. Then, once more, Trojan troops would have clambered back inside their walls, whipped weak with fear by the Argives primed for battle and they, they would have seized enormous glory, yes, defying even the great decree of Zeus, by dint of their own power and striking force. But God Apollo himself spurred on Aeneas, taking the build of Periphas, summon a son who had grown old as, herald to Aeneas' father the aged king, a loving, loyal herald too. Like him to the life, Apollo provoked Aeneas, Aeneas, how could you and your men save Troy with the gods against you? As I've seen other men who trust to their own power and striking force, their own valor, their own troop strength, even badly outmanned, defend their country well. But Zeus is with us here. Decreeing triumph for us. Not for the Argives now. But you, you're all frightened out of your minds, you cannot fight. The deadly archer, Aeneas knew him at once, looking straight in his eyes and the fighter loosed a rousing shout at Hector. Hector, all you captains of Trojans, Trojan allies, shame, what shame! Clambering back into Troy now, whipped weak with fear by the Argive forces. Look, one of the gods comes up beside me, tells me Zeus the supreme commander still impels us all in battle. So go for the Argives, head on. Don't let them bear Patroclus' body back to their ships without a fight and springing out of the lines Aeneas took his stand as the rest swung round and braced to meet the Argives. There, Aeneas lunged and speared Leocritus through, a son of Ares Bass, Lycomedes' die-hard friend. And veteran Lycomedes pitted him as he dropped, sweeping beside him, rearing, a flash of his lance and he hit a captain, Hippus' son Apiseon, slitting open his liver, up under the midriff. His knees went limp, a man who'd marched from Peonia, good fertile soil where he excelled all fighters, all but Asteropeus. 
Down to the ground he went but battling Asteropius pitted his comrade's pain and charged the Argives hard, mad to fight it out, no use, too late. They'd packed behind their shields, ringing Patroclus round on all sides, spears jutting as Arjux ranged them all and shouted out commands. No one back away from the body. No heroes either, bolting out of the Argive pack for single combat. Cluster round Patroclus, shoulder to shoulder, fight them at close range. At the giant's command the earth ran red with blood, slithering dark now and the soldiers' corpses tumbling thick and fast, Trojans and breakneck allies piled alongside Argives, how could the Argives fight without some bloody losses? But far fewer of them went down, remembering always to fight in tight formation, friend defending friend from headlong slaughter. So on they fought like a swirl of living fire, you could not say if the sun and moon still stood secure, so dense the battle haze that engulfed the brave who stood their ground around Patroclus' body. But the other Trojans and Argive men-at-arms fought on at their ease beneath a clear blue sky, sharp brilliance of sunlight glittering round them, not a cloud in sight to shadow the earth and mountains. Men who fought at a distance worked with frequent breaks, dodging painful arrows that showered side to side. But men who held the center suffered agonies, thanks to the haze and carnage, ruthless bronze hacking their lines to pieces, there where the bravest fought. Yet two men there, famous fighters, Antilochus flanking Thrasymede still had not caught word of Patroclus' death, they thought the gallant soldier still alive, fighting Trojans up on the clashing front lines. But the two men kept their lookout, always alert to their comrades' deaths or signs of instant flight as the two fought out on the flank, just as Nestor ordered, sending both sons forth from the black ships to battle. So all day long for the men of war the fighting raged, grim and grueling, relentless, drenching labor, non-stop, and the knees, shins and feet that upheld each fighter, their hands, their eyes, ran with the sweat of struggle over the great runner Achilles' steadfast aid in arms, an enormous tug-of-war. As when some master tanner gives his crews the hide of a huge bull for stretching, the beast's skin soaked in grease and the men grab hold, bracing round in a broad circle, tugging, stretching hard till the skin's oils go dripping out as the grease sinks in, so many workers stretch the whole hide tough and taut, so back and forth in a cramped space they tugged, both sides dragging the corpse and hopes rising, Trojans hoping to drag Patroclus back to Troy, Achaeans to drag him back to the hollow. Ships and round him always the brutal struggle raging. Not even ours, lasher of armies, not even Athena watching the battle here could scorn its fury, not even in their most savage lust for combat, no, so tense the work of war for the men and chariot teams that Zeus stretched taut across Patroclus this one day. But great Achilles knew nothing yet of Patroclus' death. They were fighting far afield of the deep sea ships, beneath the Trojan wall, so Achilles never feared his friend was dead, he must be still alive, pressing onto the very gates, but he'd come back. Achilles never dreamed Patroclus would storm all Troy without him, not even with him. No, time and again his mother that he's told him this was not to be, she told him alone, in secret, always bringing word of mighty Zeus's plans, but not this time. One thing she never told him, his own mother, what a terrible thing had taken place, his dearest friend in arms on earth lay dead. Over his corpse no let up, the fighters kept on thrusting wetted spears, locked in endless struggle, cutting each other down and an Argive armed in bronze would call out, Friends! Our glory's gone if we fall back now on the ships, let the black earth gape and take us all at once, here and now. Better for us that way, by far, if we yield his corpse to the stallion-breaking Trojans, all to drag him back to Troy and win the glory. And a hardy Trojan would call on his side, Friends! What if it's fated for us to die beside this body, all dead in a mass? Let no man quit the battle so they would say, fueling comrades' courage. And so they fought and the iron din went rising up to the bronze sky through the barren breathless air. But standing clear of the fray Achilles' horses wept from the time they first had sensed their driver's death, brought down in the dust by man-killing Hector. Dior's rugged son Automedon did his best, lashed them over and over with stinging whip, coaxing them gently now, now shouting oath on oath. But both balked at returning now to the ships moored at the Hellespont's far reaching shore or galloping back to fight beside the Argives. Staunch as a pillar planted tall above a barrow, standing sentry over some lord or lady's grave site, so they stood, holding the blazoned chariot stock still, their heads trailing along the ground, warm tears flowing down from their eyes to wet the earth, the horses mourned, longing now for their driver, their luxurious mane soiled, streaming down from the yoke pads, down along the yoke. And Zeus pitied them, watching their tears flow. 
he shook his head and addressed his own deep heart, poor creatures, why did we give you to King Peleus, a mortal doom to death, you immortal beasts who never age or die? So you could suffer the pains of wretched men? There is nothing alive more agonized than man of all that breathe and crawl across the earth. But Hector, at least, will never ride behind you, you and your blazoned chariot. I will never permit it. What more does he want? The arms are enough for him, Priam's son with his empty, futile boasting. But I will fill your legs and hearts with strength so you can save Automedon, bear him from the fighting back to the fleet. For still I will give the Trojans glory, killing all the way to the bench ships till the sun sinks and the blessed darkness sweeps across the earth. And with that he breathed fresh fire in the team. They shook the dust from their manes and galloped off, speeding the fast chariot just where the armies clashed. Automedon fought as he rode, though grieving for his friend, swooping in with the team like a vulture after geese. Now he'd veer from the Trojan melee in a flash then dart back in a charge, pursuing mobs of men but he could not kill the ones he rushed in force, no way for him now, alone in the hurtling car, to lunge with a spear and still control those racers. But at last a cohort marked the driver's straits, Alcimedon the son of Laerces, Hemon's grandson coming behind the chariot, shouted out, Automedon, what god has put such a tactic in your head? It's good for nothing, he's torn your wits away. Taking the Trojans on alone, on the front lines but your comrades dead, look, and Hector himself, strapped in Achilles' armor, swaggers on in glory. Dior's son Automedon shouted back, Alcimedon. What other Achaean driver could match your skill at curbing this deathless team or spurring on their fury? Only Patroclus, skilled as the gods themselves while the man was still alive, now death and fate have got him in their grip. On with it. Take up the whip and shining reins, I'll dismount the car and fight on foot. Alcimedon sprang aboard the hurtling chariot, quickly grasping the whip and reins in both fists as Automedon leapt to ground. But Hector saw them and called at once to Aeneas posted close beside him, Aeneas, counsellor of the Trojans armed in bronze, I can see the great runner Achilles' team, look there, heading into the fight but reined by feeble drivers. So my hopes ride high that we can seize them now if you have the heart to join me. Charge! Those two will flinch, they'd never dare stand up to us man to man in all-out battle. And Anchise's gallant son did not resist. They went straight on, shoulders shielded in oxide tanned and tough and hammered thick with bronze. And a brace of fighters, Chromius, strong Aratus flanked their attack and the Trojans had high hopes of killing the men and driving off the massive stallions. Reckless fools! They'd never disengage from Automedon, not without some bloodshed. No, with a prayer to Zeus some new fighting power had filled his dark heart and he quickly called his trusted friend Alcimedon. Alcimedon, keep those horses close beside me, breathing down my neck. Nothing can hold him back, this Hector in all his fury, nothing, I tell you, not till he leaps behind Achilles' long main team and kills us both and routs our forward line, or he goes down himself in the first assault. And he called the two Eantes and Menelaus, Arjux, Arjux, lords of the Argives, Menelaus. Lead Patroclus now to the best men you can find, they'll straddle the corpse and fight off Trojan packs, you fight the fatal day from us, we're still alive. Here they come, full tilt, Aeneas and Hector, Troy's best men, bearing down on us here, this point of tears and attack. But all lies in the lap of the great gods. I'll fling a spear myself and leave the rest to Zeus. He aimed and hurled and his spear's long shadow flew and hit Aratus square in the balanced round shield, no blocking the shaft, the bronze ram through, piercing his belt and gouging down his belly. As a burly farmhand wielding a wetted axe, chopping a field-ranging bull behind the horns, hacks through its whole hump and the beast heaves up then topples forward, so Aratus reared, heaving up then toppled down on his back. The slashing spear shuddered tense in his guts and the man was gone. A flash of a lance, Hector hurled at Automedon who kept his eyes right on him, dodged the bronze, ducking down with a quick lunge, and behind his back the heavy spears half plunged and stuck in the earth, the butt end quivering into the air till suddenly rugged R snuffed its fury out, dead still. Now they would have attacked with swords, close up, incensed, but the two Eantes drove a wedge between them, plowing through the press at their comrades' call. Cowering backward fast the Trojans gave ground, Hector, Aeneas and Chromius, noble prince, deserted Aratus there, his life torn out, sprawled on the spot. Automedon rushed in, wild as the god of war to strip the armor off, shouting in savage exultation. 
Now, by heaven, I've eased the grief of Patroclus' ghost a little, though the man I battered down was half as great as he. With that he tossed the bloody gear in the chariot, climbed aboard with his hands and feet dripping gore like a lion that rends and bolts a bull. And now, again, the fight for Patroclus flared, stretched to the breaking point, mounting in tears, in fury, since Pallas fired their blood, sweeping down from the heavens, sent by the father thundering far and wide to drive the Argives on, for now his mind had changed, at least for a moment. Yes, down like a lurid rainbow Zeus sends arching down to mortal men from the high skies, a sign of war or blizzard to freeze the summer's warmth and put a halt to men's work on the face of the earth and harry flocks, so shrouded round in a lurid cloud came Pallas now and dove in the Argive ranks to fire up each man. And the first one she roused was Atreus' son powerful Menelaus, he stood right at hand, she took the build and tireless voice of Phoenix, yours is the shame, Atrides. You will hang your head if under the walls of Troy the dogs in all their frenzy drag and maul the proud Achilles' steadfast friend. Hold on, full force, spur all our men to battle. The lord of the war cry told the goddess quickly, Phoenix, father, good old soldier if only Pallas would give me power and drive the weapons off me. Then I'd gladly stand and fight for Patroclus. My comrade's death has cut me to the quick. But Hector keeps his terrible fury blazing, keeps his bronze spear stabbing and never stops the slaughter, Zeus hands him glory. Her grey eyes afire, the goddess Pallas thrilled that the man had prayed to her before all other gods. She put fresh strength in his back, spring in his knees and filled his heart with the horsefly's raw daring, brush it away from a man's flesh and back it comes, biting, attacking, crazed for sweet human blood. With such raw daring she filled his dark heart and he bestrode Patroclus, flung a gleaming spear, and there was a Trojan, Aetian's son called Pods, well-bred, wealthy, and Hector prized him most in all the realm a first-rate drinking friend. As he sprang in flight the red-haired captain hit him, splitting his belt, and bronze went ripping through his flesh and down he went with a crash. Atrides hauled his corpse from under the Trojans toward his own massing friends. But Hector, Apollo stood by him and drove him on, disguised as Phenops, Aetius son Abido's bomb, dearest to Hector of all his foreign guests. Like him to the life, the deadly archer taunted, Hector, what Achaean will ever fear you now? Look how you cringe in the face of Menelaus, no great fighter before this, a weakling, soft. He's gone and snatched a corpse from under our noses, single-handed he's taken down your trusted comrade brave in the front ranks, Pods, Aetian's son. A black cloud of grief came shrouding over Hector but helmed in flashing bronze he hurtled through the front. That very moment the son of Cronus, seized his storm shield, rippling and flaring bright, and shrouding Ida in dark clouds, loosed a bolt with a huge crack of thunder, shook the shield, gave the Trojans triumph and routed fear-struck Argives. And the first to beat retreat, a Boeotian, Penelios. Charging forward as always, head on, until Polydama speared his shoulder, just grazing its ridge but grating bone, he thrust at point blank range. Close range too, Hector stabbed the wrist of Latus, brave Electrian's son, and knocked him out of action. No hope left he could wield a spear against the Trojans, no more fighting now, Latus looked around and ran. But as Hector rushed him, Idomenia speared Hector, struck the plate on his chest beside the nipple, his long spears half splintered off at the head and the Trojans shouted out. And Hector hurled at Idomeneus now aboard a chariot missed by a hair but he caught Merion's aid and driver Coeranus, one who'd come with his lord from rock-built Lictus. Idomeneus had left the ships on foot that morning and would have offered the Trojans a fine triumph now if Coeranus had not rushed to the rescue, lashed his team and come like light to the king, he saved his life that day but he quickly lost his own to man-killing Hector. Hector speared him under the jaw and ear, knocking teeth out, shattering roots and all and split his tongue in half. He pitched from his car, the reins poured to the ground and on foot Marion's grabbed them up in his hands, shouting out at Idomeneus, whip them hard now back to the fast ships. You see for yourself, no power left in the Argives. So Marion's yelled and Idomeneus whipped the team with their mains streaming, back to the hollow ships, fear seized the king at last. Lionhearted Arjax and Menelaus were not blind, they saw Zeus turn the tide toward the Trojans. Telamonian Arjax voiced frustration first, dear God, enough. Any idiot boy could see how Father Zeus himself supports these Trojans. All their weapons land, no matter who flings them, brave fighter or bad Zeus guides them all to the mark. Ours all clatter to ground. Wasted, harmless shots. So come, alone as we are, find the best way out, 
How do we pull the body clear and save ourselves, make it back to our lines and bring our friends some joy? They look our way in despair, they must. All hope gone that murderous Hector's rage and invincible spear arm can be stopped, not now, he'll hurl himself against our blackened hulls. If only an aide could speed the word to Achilles. I'm certain he has not heard the dreadful news that his dear friend lies dead. Wherever I look, no use, I cannot see the Achaean for the mission, such swirling mist blots out the men and horses both. O oh Father Zeus, draw our armies clear of the cloud, give us a bright sky, give us back our sight. Kill us all in the light of day at least, since killing's now your pleasure. So he prayed and the father filled with pity, seeing Arjax weep. He dispelled the mist at once, drove off the cloud and the sun came blazing forth and the whole war swung into view, clear, that instant, an Arjax called the lord of the war cry, Menelaus, look hard for Antilochus now, my royal friend. If you see him still alive, brave Nestor's son, tell him to run the news to great Achilles quickly, his dearest friend in arms on earth lies dead. And the lord of the battle cry could not refuse but dragged his heels like a lion leaving sheepfolds, bone weary from harrying hounds and field hands. They'll never let him tear the rich fat from the oxen, all night long they stand their guard but the lion craves meat, he lunges in and in but his charges gain him nothing, thick and fast from their hardy hands the javelins rain down in his face, and waves of roaring torches, these the big cat fears, balking for all his rage, and at dawn he slinks away, his spirits dashed. And so the lord of the war cry left Patroclus, resisting all the way, he feared the worst, stampeded in terror, his men would leave the body easy prey for the Trojans. So here Menelaus paused with much to command Marion's and the Eantes. Arjax and Arjax, captains of Achaea, Marion's too, remember Patroclus now, our stricken comrade. That gentle man, the soul of kindness to all while the man was still alive. Now death and fate have got him in their grip. And with that the red-haired captain moved ahead like an eagle scanning left and right, the bird men say has the sharpest eyes of all that fly the heavens, high as he soars he'll never miss the racing hare cowering down low in the dense, shaggy brush, down on its head he swoops and pins it fast and rips its life away. So now, Menelaus O oh my king, you turned your shining eyes, scanning the crowds of comrades front and rear, trying to see if Nestor's son was still alive. He marked him quickly, out on the left flank and rousing cohorts, driving them back to war, and the red-haired captain halted near and called, turn this way, Antilochus, prince, and hear the news, dreadful news would to God it had never happened. You see for yourself, I know, how Father Zeus sends waves of ruin breaking down our lines, victory goes to Troy. Our best Achaeans dead, Patroclus, a stunning loss to all our armies. Quick, run to Achilles' moorings up the beach and tell him all. Perhaps but he must be fast, he can bring the body safely back to his ship, stripped as Patroclus is, Hector with that flashing helmet has his armor. Antilochus listened closely, hating every word. He stood there speechless a while, struck dumb, tears filling his eyes, his strong voice choked. But he still would not neglect a tride's order. So handing his gear to a loyal aide Laodicus, who maneuvered his pouring horses close by, he set off at a run. But he wept freely now as his feet swept him clear of the close fighting, bearing the dreadful news to Peleus' son Achilles. But you, Menelaus, O oh my king, you had no heart to defend the Pylians, hard pressed as they were, once their leader left, a heavy blow to his troops. And putting the veteran Thrasymedes in command, he ran back to bestride Patroclus' corpse again and flanking the two Eantes now, reported briskly. I sent Antilochus. He's off to the fast ships to tell the swift Achilles. But I've little hope he'll come at all, for all his rage at Hector. How can he fight the Trojans without armor? So come, alone as we are, find the best way out, how do we pull the body clear and save ourselves from the Trojan uproar, flee our death, our fate? The great Telamonian Arjax answered firmly, all true, straight to the point, Lord Menelaus. Quickly, you and Mary own shoulder up the body, carry it off the lines. We're right behind you, fighting the Trojans, fighting this Prince Hector. The two Eantes bearing the same fury, the same name, and no strangers at standing up to slashing ours, each defending the other side by side. So he urged and up from the earth they caught the body in their arms, hoisting it high above their heads with a great heave, and Trojan forces crowding behind them shouted out when they saw the Argive fighters lift the corpse. 
they swept in like hounds that fling themselves at a wounded boar before young hunters reach him, darting in for a moment, keen to rip the boar apart till he wheels at bay, ramping into the pack with all his power and the hounds cringe and bolt and scatter left and right. And so the Trojans kept on pressing, squad on squad, stabbing away with swords and two-edged spears till the two called Arjaks wheeled against them hard to make a stand, and they turned white, none had nerve to charge forth now and fight it out for the corpse. So they labored to haul Patroclus from the war, back to the beaked ships as fighting flared behind them wild as a flash fire, sprung out of nowhere, storming down on a teeming city, houses caving into the big blaze as gale winds whip it into a roaring conflagration. So rose the relentless din of horse and fighting men breaking against them now as they struggled back to shore. Dead set as mules who put their backs in the labor, dragging down from the cliffs along a stony trail some roof beam or a heavy ship timber, slogging until they nearly burst their hearts with sweat and labor, so they strained to carry off the corpse. Right behind them the two Eantes held the Trojans off as a wooded rocky ridge stretched out across an entire plain holds back a flood, fighting off the killer tides of the mounting rivers, beating them all back to swamp the lowland flats, none of their pounding waves can make a breakthrough. So the two Eantes kept on beating the Trojans off but on they came, assaulting the rear, two in the lead, Aeneas the son of Anchises flanking glorious Hector. Flying before them now like clouds of crows or starling screaming murder, seeing a falcon dive in for the kill, the hawk that wings grim death at smaller birds, so pursued by Aeneas and Hector Argive fighters raced, screaming death cries. Lust for battle lost and masses of fine armor littered both sides of the trench as the Argives fled in fear, no halt in the fighting, not now. <laughs>